You guys doing okay? Yes? No? Maybe? Yes. Maybe make it louder so they can actually hear me. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Palmer, and I uh, like to uh, welcome you back to the afternoon sessions. I'm also speaking now. So I appreciate it. While you need to do business in the background, I can hear you guys talking. And it's very hard for me to talk on stage if you're talking in the back. Thank you. So um, I'm Jeff Pulver. I'm a been involved in tech for a very long time, and I've been very fortunate in my life to be around uh, several major tectonic changes in the world in terms of uh, technology and business. When I entered the business world was a time that spreadsheets came of age. And while the, uh, the introduction of spreadsheets didn't really put anyone out of business, it certainly was a major shift in how we all did business. And uh, <coughs> after being on the advisory board at Lotus for seven years, I could tell you that the biggest shift ever was the fact of the effect of uh, the introduction of spreadsheets to dairy farming. It was one industry which the uh, developers at Lotus never ever thought they would actually touch or change. But you know, when you disrupt something, it's always those unintended consequences of what happens as a result of introduction of change, which uh, changes the world. And um, I'm just curious, uh, has anyone here, here, anyone in this room hear me speak before? Raise your hands, a few. So just to give a little introduction and why I actually am speaking here today. So uh, fu fundamentally, uh, I, I, I embrace disruption. Um, ask a different question. How many people here in the room today in their everyday life uh, use services on their phones where they maybe communicate with somebody? Near, nearby or anywhere around the world, whether using video or voice? <laughs> and how many people here are paying for it? Well, for those that don't raise your hand, you're all welcome. <laughs> uh, and if you pay for it, thank you, because those service providers appreciate that. Um, back in 1995, I um, launched a project on the internet. There was no, uh, I, I, I could have done an ICO back then, but what I did is I launched the first phone network that ran on the internet called Free World Dial-Up. And Free World Dial-Up uh, was free, it connected the world, and it li literally ran on dial-up. And it, it was uh, a foreshadowing seven years before Skype. And what FWD provided was a platform and an internet of 16 million people that went viral. And uh, six months after I launched Free World Dial-Up, 300 phone companies went to the Federal Communications Commission <laughs> and he asked for the sale and use of internet telephony software to be banned in America and, and the makers to be regulated as phone companies. And while I had a day job at the time, I used to work on Wall Street, I'm a former expert in fixed income mathematics, I built trading systems, but I had this day job. And uh, I thought it was quite humorous that on my mailing list it was exploding that all these people were saying, what was I going to do to stop this the FCC? And I, turns out I'm a ham operator. My, my standing in Washington is because I'm an amateur radio operator. I got, I learned, when I was 12 years old, I passed the test to be a ham operator, so I understand what the FCC can regulate, at least for me, but I certainly didn't know anything about telecom. But out of the ether, literally, after about 10 days, I gathered uh, from my mailing list 110 companies, and uh, we created the Voice on the Net Coalition, and for, and for literally nine years, we were able to keep voice over IP unregulated. Never in the history of, 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 of uh, public advocacy at any organization yet, including the FCC, ever see a group just show up. And 110 companies from all over the world were there and present, and they very publicly were saying what these other companies were trying to do were, was just crazy. So that was the first sign of disruption and change, because when you introduce, when you introduce something into a marketplace where incumbents look for laws that were invented prior to the innovation, um, that was disruptive. And uh, what I ended up doing was getting fired from my day job, which is a good thing, because it saved my life. I, I'm very fortunate to be fired. I, I encourage all of you to be fired. It's a very <laughs> hard one. But it, it is, it, ha it helped me a lot, because uh, I worked for a company that on 9-11 lost 700 people. I am grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to be present here. And in between um, getting fired and 9-11, um, I ended up doing some work which helped bring together the world of communications. Free World Dial-Up was a cornerstone event, a watershed event. And then in the fall of 96, I started creating conferences where people came together to explore the future together. 
uh, not realizing that a year later some of my friends, my new friends, would start companies which have multi-billion dollar market caps. But you know, living through those 90s and living through those years of opportunity, you also saw chances to be disrupted and chances of change. And the, um, what I ended up doing was running and creating an event which helped create the uh, voice over IP industry, which today is, relative terms, only a $2 trillion market. Um, but during the days of the conference that I was running, about 120 of my friends got acquired by seven others, and 35 of them went public, and it was just a fun time. And I, I learned how to take having fun seriously. What I did intentionally is I brought the, the FCC and state regulators to my conferences, because the one thing I was able to do was to neutralize the, poly, neutralize the uh, <coughs> lobbyists by putting the, the, the nascent VOIP industry in front of the regulators. We were able to cut through the, the crap and have direct dialogue and people understood one-on-one -on -one where the state of the market was. That was incredibly effective. I wish I could take credit for actually thinking of it. It was something I just did because it felt intuitive at the time to do that. And then, um, and then while I was doing that, I noticed people at my conferences were meeting each other, doing these meetings, and. What I didn't realize is that people were creating phone networks running over the internet, and so I created a spot market. I had a fintech startup, which created a spot market for voice over IP. And uh, in the year 2000, while I was running the conferences, I got a little bored, a little jealous of these B2B exchanges start going public. I felt so left out. So I hired a guy who had started Daytech Online and started uh, Island DCN, and I shared with him the vision for the Minutes Exchange. And, while I was doing that, I told them that the next company I want to do is a voice over broadband service provider. And a year later, more or less, uh, the company pivoted, and that company became Vonage. So I, I kind of accidentally started Vonage. Uh, <laughs> but it was an accident because it wasn't intentional, but it wasn't, I don't believe in it. It's just that it wasn't necessarily the, what I set out to do. But we're now living in this another change. And so I ended up. Um, helping to change the world communicates by embracing innovation, by learning how to innovate, and, and certainly by not going against the law. I, I, I might have done certain things as a kid, which is now hopefully uh, enough time before me, so if I might have been a hacker or a radio pirate or other things, hopefully there's a uh, statute of limitations for some of that. But there's not a statute of limitations what you learn from things. From being disruptive as a kid, I mean, I'm very grateful to grow up in a family where my parents enabled me to, to, to be an entrepreneur. When, when I was a kid, I had a very bad, uh, very poor social life. I, I was lonely. I don't know if any of you have ever been lonely. I don't know if any of you have ever really experienced what it's like not to have so many friends where to find a friend, you'd maybe adopt the music of someone so you'd have something in common with them. But for, for me, the whole reason I got into radio, and for some ways how I ended up in blockchain, was looking for things in common with others. And, you know, the, my, whole, my whole life story kind of starts when I, was an eight, when I was eight years old, and my dad was telling me to uh, talk to one of my uncles, because he was a ham operator, and that I should see him in his office, and that my life, that I should, he had a secret that I needed to know. And I don't know if you remember when you were eight or whether or not you listened to your parents, but I never called my uncle up. But on that faithful day, I show up home from school, and my uncle's waiting for me to take me to his office, and he had a factory on Long Island, and I, I went there, got a factory tour, no big deal, because you know, they work for my uncle, so everyone has to be nice. And it wasn't until I went into my, my <laughs> uncle's office in his office, which had just a table, a box on it, a microphone, and I had no idea what was about to happen, but he flipped a switch and the box started to glow because these are radio tubes. And I heard noise. There was a noise because he turned the dial and he heard voices, I heard noise. And at that moment in time, he turned, he found this clear spot and he spoke very cryptically. He said, CQ, CQ. This is K2QQ, I'm calling CQ. He said it for a minute, <coughs> let go of the microphone. And then for an hour, there were people in a queue all waiting to talk to my Uncle Fred. But all he would say is, his name is Fred, he's in Farmingdale, New York, and he gave a signal report. And magically, no matter where in the world those people were from, they all wanted to talk to him. They exchanged signal reports, they said their location. And I realized very quickly, my uncle had found the cure for loneliness for me. All I had to do was take that radio off his desk in his office, put it into my bedroom, and before I went to school in the morning, and when I came home, I had friends. But there was a catch. My uncle did not give me his radio. 
See, in order to be a ham operator, you had to learn Morse code, you had to teach yourself college level physics, and you, you had to uh, learn the rules from the FCC of uh, Reg, Reg 97. And so I didn't get a ham license when I was nine or eight. I got it when I was 12 and a half. And I'm happy to say that I, I, once I had my license to communicate, I haven't shut up since. But the opportunity to learn on my own and teach myself what I know is a gift my parents gave me. Also, it turns out that you know, when you're lonely and you don't have too many friends, you get to be creative and innovative. And so I, 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 I was a hacker when I was in sixth grade. I did all sorts of stuff on I learned that we, I had a, a, a 110 board modem, a teletype machine. And I used to go, I did things that I read about. I bought Steel, this book by Abby Hoffman. He was our uh, interesting character to learn about. And uh, I learned about programming and coding and hacking from some of the best people I know, at least I read about. And uh, I got into this because I was passionate about it. And, and the thing about the, you know, the, the early days of computer and radio is the one thing I learned about was to pursue a passion. I became an entrepreneur because you know, it, was, it just felt natural. I realized I was a misfit. I realized that when I, I don't know if any of you actually would admit you're a misfit, but I'll tell you that when, if you don't fit in, maybe it takes your entire life to feel comfortable in your own skin, but when you do, you fuck it, you own it, right? And so I'm a misfit. I, I've only worked for a few people in my life. Most of the other time I've worked for myself. And so when I had this day job on Wall Street, it was sort of not fitting in for me, but I, I had this license to communicate and learn about voice over IP and learn about disruption. And frankly, it's taken me over 20 years to find something as equally powerful as the introduction of spreadsheets in business, equally as po powerful as the innovation of, of, of changing the way the world communicates. And what's before you guys today, and all of you are here for that reason, I believe, is to understand the magic of blockchain. To understand the magic <coughs> that, some, for some of you, this might be a business you're looking into. How many people here are actively trading cryptocurrencies? And how many people here are thinking about doing an ICO? And how many people here are just trying to figure out what's going on? So, we're in this moment in time. Now, we, now you may believe in different levels of presence and being high. And, high. and, and there, there, there are times when life gives you a chance to relive something. For all of you that were alive in the 90s and wish you took a different outcome, here's another chance. The, the internet taught us many things. Certainly some of my friends that were billionaires or mega millionaires and then woke up and they had nothing because they failed to sell. They're holding on to their stock, the dot-com crash happened and gone. Some were humble, some were not. But you know the thing is, you learn it if you want to or you can ignore it if you choose to, but it's, it's an opportunity to learn sometimes. And so I've had life experiences that have taught me to be humble and to be appreciative of every moment that I have left and to be here for certain reasons. And so. To, to understand that the, 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 the in, where we are right now is truly in the infancy of, uh, of blockchain. Some people, Stephen would think it's 1991, I think it's more like 1994. A lot of great things are in front of us that will happen. But the biggest thing to understand is that this is not necessarily about trading cryptocurrency. This is not necessarily about doing an ICO. The, what we're talking about is a change of how assets are going to be tracked, how information will be shared, and how each and every one of us will interact ultimately with, e with each other. This is a tectonic change that's at an order of magnitude that it's hard to explain until after you see it from far away. This is really big. Um, from a practical perspective, one of the challenges we've had, and you can thank Stephen who spoke earlier today, uh, so he created the killer app for Ethereum, he invented the ICO. Stephen and the former C uh, SEC chairman spent five months figuring out how to legally it do uh, a crowdfunding event where when, he, when Ethereum raised $18 million, it was by five times bigger in order of magnitude of any crowdfunding that was ever done before that. And it, was, it's, and it was the first time they had a ruling, they actually had a letter that said they were not a security. Now, ever since that work that Stephen did with Ethereum and the many ICOs that he worked on since, people more or less in practical terms, copy-pasted his work, and many of the coins you see out there until recently have all been functional coins or call them utility tokens. 
the challenge we have with that is that all those tokens, that whole ecosystem that you guys are trading, to the extent that you're speculating on them, by definition, the, they're securities. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that my friends at the SEC are, will, 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 will uh, cramp down on you, but I warn you to be careful, because you know when something is a security, there's something called insider trading. When something isn't a security, there's a gray area about insider trading, insider knowledge, or just people who just think that laws don't apply, and so they don't apply. I promise you, today is not the best time in the world to be this tallest tree in a lightning storm. Today is not necessarily the time also to be looking at the edge of the gray and the black and the white between what utility tokens were supposed to do. Because 2014 happened, brand new, great opportunities, 2015 happened, but something happened by the end of last year which brought the attention of the world regulators. Now, unlike me, when I was dealing with voice over IP and I could have some fun at the expense of some of my telco friends, I was able to show how innovation was actually gonna change the world. I was always in line with the government when it came with regulation, I might fight it. I might file a petition at the FCC that I did in 2003, but I was very much in band with that and then Ed Guy was a former CTO of Free World Dial-Up. Uh, I had an amazing experience when, um, by the way, any of you ever file a petition at the FCC? So you know about the public uh, filing. So in my case, I put out, a, I put out a, a petition and then it actually went out for public comment. Then for 30 days, the world crapped on me. Uh, people were attacking the merit of me, attacking the merit of my petition. Then I had 30 days to respond. Then in May of 2003, um, it was the uh, DOJ and the FBI. They said that I was actually harboring Al Qaeda <laughs> and that my, my petition was actually to prevent uh, broadband wiretapping. So whenever that happens, you have to go to Washington. We went to an unmarked building at, at the old MCI buildings. It's that Computer Crimes Division. And it kind of felt like we were like on the set of Law and Order. And what was very creepy was that there were more people from the government that were there that actually introduced themselves to us. <clears throat> And at no moment in time did they ever expect me to say to them, hey, if you want to track down the criminals, the bad guys, just take ownership of the service. Like, I was giving it away. And they were said, you know, so I didn't hu we didn't hug it out that day, but I, I left Washington with a couple of new friends. But, but the thing was, I did not ever, I did not ever uh, pull out the FCC <coughs> for being a regulator, or the C or, 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 the, or any of whether, or Oftel or anyone else. <coughs> When ITU summoned me in 1997 to explain to the world, to, to the Board of Governors at the ITU, why voice over IP should be allowed across, government, uh, across countries, I told them I was not qualified to be there. I had no standing other than the fact I was running a free phone service and I was just a rebel, but they actually wanted to hear my voice. And I showed up in, in Geneva and shared my ideas. The thing is, you're dealing with securities or not, there's, that, there's laws, right? orange jumpsuits, all these ugly things you think about could happen. I promise you, when you look around the conference, when you have thousands of people, the following year, some of those people may not be there for that very reason. Because ignorance of the law is no excuse. We're at a point now of maturity in the blockchain industry where we need to have best practices. We have to be working together as a group, as a group, and understand that when you look at certain ICOs, if they look too good to be true, they probably are. If something seems spammy and scammy, you should call it out. We have to find ways to actually stand above the crap that's out there so that if someone is stealing from someone else, because what will the government do if someone is stealing someone else's life savings from Main Street, the Main Street investors, they're gonna come in and they're gonna shut this stuff down. They're not gonna necessarily shut down the actual experience, but they'll shut down those people and everyone around them that was responsible directly or indirectly for what happened. So we have to be watchful. We have to work as a community worldwide and have best practices for exchanges, how exchanges operate so there's trust. You know, the internet was built on trust and it gets hacked every day. You, know, you, you can argue with the people, with the founding fathers of the internet that maybe we shouldn't have been so trust, trustworthy because every protocol that gets, the reason we see DOS attacks and everything else is because it was built on trust. Um, now is a time we need to think clearly <coughs> that when you're going to do an ICO, invest in ICO, that you actually follow a best practice if you're an investor, if you're a creator, if you are going to be a future regulator, if you're going to be a future runner of an exchange. 
we're in that magical time though, we can get it right. It's not cast in stone, it's going to be wrong. But those people today that don't, that are, that don't understand that when you, when you invest in an ICO and you're simply speculating for it to go up 10 times, by definition, it could very well be a security. Okay. By definition, right? So there's a concept of utility, there's a concept of protocol, there's a certain way to actually define certain types of, of utility. But the nice thing that the, the best thing the SEC could have ever done was when they came out last year in December, and then again in the hearings in Washington, where the chairman of the SEC very politely and very pointedly said that he had not seen an ICO that doesn't look like a security. Heads up, change is gonna happen. <clears throat> Now the really nice thing is that there's an opportunity for all of you, whether you represent uh, pension funds, uh, uh, hedge funds, whether you represent uh, your own money and others, to actually invest in security tokens. This is something that nobody in the day of crowdfunding would ever touch. Because oh my god, it's a security. Because every exchange you probably are on right now, they're unregulated. Unregulated versus regulated. Unregulated gives you fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Great for opportunities. Forget it, we're not even gonna talk about the fact that we don't know how to do the accounting. We don't understand about long-term token gains, long-term token losses. We don't understand necessarily how to handle those things. But simply put, we have to be aware, because again, ignorance of the law is no excuse. So, so if you're going to be investing, the good news is that while we ne haven't necessarily figured out custody yet, and I haven't seen AIG come forward to offer crypto reinsurance, it's going to happen. Uh, Steven and I have both, Steven, I was just watching, but Steven worked on the, uh, the security token for um, T0, and this is the first time that a publicly traded company um, actually issued a security token. Now the difference here is that with a security token, there's law, it's regulated. There's no doubt, it's actually out there. There's an offer, there's, it's, a, it's a formal process with understanding. So by the way, for those of you who have friends that are doing ICOs and you're telling your friend to invest, if, you don't, how many, if you're not a broker dealer, you might not wanna do that. <laughs> Just saying. Because uh, you're held accountable. I mean, it, again, there are laws. So there's a reason why there are registered broker dealers. There's a reason why a Series 79 exam exists is so that you understand what you're doing as opposed to just playing with monopoly money. But the world's changing, so we look past all that. So in 2018, what I see is an evolution that started. We have the legacy of utility tokens. Some will be cast aside, I promise you a few years from now, some of the tokens that are trading at high value will go to zero. As did our friends that did one public, you know, pets.com and others, they go to zero too because the timing was wrong, or maybe they broke a law. But the opportunity to take an asset and put it on the blockchain and create a blockchain which has trillions of other assets available for trading, that cat's out of the bag. And that fundamental shift is upon us. And there's great opportunities for each and every one of you and thousands and tens of thousands of others to figure this out. When I'm around my friend Steven, I always tell, I always look at the world of crypto as Gotham City. I look at Steven as Batman. <laughs> and the thing about Gotham City, it's hard to get into, but it's really hard to get out of. And if you look at for yourself of how you got involved in crypto and having to deal with a wallet, well, what the fuck? And then you have to, you have to like get on, like, you gotta get on exchange. The, the reality of the, 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 how greedy people are in places like Coinbase, are you kidding me? But every time you wanna do it, you want, these commissions are crazy. Crazy! You want to be disruptive? Do something with, you know, for free. <laughs> Run a bank for free for, for a month. Woo! Try it out. <laughs> you'll get a lot of customers, and you'll actually be able to have a, a, a business that works. But right now, the people that are involved around the world are greedy. They're greedy on the on ramps, on the off ramps, and they don't care about you. They just care about the greed. You know, if you transfer a Coinbase between two people on Coinbase, they still charge you commissions. Why? Why? Because they can, because they get away with it. So it is an opportunity for those people, if, if so from the voice, world of voice over IP, I can tell you about arbitrage. I can tell you that the early days of voice over IP, people made a lot of money in arbitrage. And then it got thinned out. 
Jeff Citron, when he actually, before he left and came to Vonage, and created Vonage, at Daytech Online, um, he took out all those commissions and retail brokerage. I'm waiting for someone to take out the retail broker, the retail commissions here. Because the true value is the institutions. Here's the real facts. The facts are that a new type of funding mechanism now exists for the everybody. It is true, and there will be certain case studies where a utility token makes total sense because it's a pure utility, we know it, it's a protocol, it just works. For everyone else, we have the opportunity for the magical part about a security token, which is its versatility. See, typically in the past, if you go public, you have your stock, and all that represents is equity interest in your company. Voting, non-voting, you have all those rights. The magical part about security tokens is you get to be creative. Every company today, every company that issues a token can be different. Some can pledge 17% of gross profit, I could pledge 18% of EBITDA, someone else could present can actually create something. And so you can create an instrument that's not debt, not necessarily ownership, that has a component of uh, value, so it's a dividend. It could have a component of value that perhaps um, perhaps it's going to represent uh, a discount so that if, I'm a con if, I, if I have a, a brokerage firm, I do an ICO, Wait, what a thought. And you buy my tokens, and if you hold on to 1,000 tokens, you get a 5% discount. If you're holding on to 1,000 tokens, it's free trading, free trading. So all of a sudden, there's utility associated with present, present functionality. You could do this, and every token that trades will have different values. So trying to understand how to model this is gonna be hard, but you get to be creative, and that's what finance hasn't had before. Before, in the world of fixed income, I could project out based on mathematics. Here, there's a little bit of modeling, but it gets to be fun. But you're so early in this game that we can mess this all up and still be there. But you have to be willing to take chances and not accept the greed of others. This is, not a chance, this is a chance we actually can provide value to people all over the world. But one of the promises of the internet was that somebody growing up in a third world country would have the opportunity to have their idea um, created and served. It started to happen with Twitter, because one of the, I'm an early investor in Twitter, and despite all its problems, the ability for one person randomly, one person's voice randomly to be amplified a million times by total strangers, and certainly in times of crisis to be able to get the word out is amazing. And so you start to see value of the internet, because we're living in a world right now with seven and a half billion people, with the connectivity that's out there, we're connecting about three and a half, four billion of us. You know, I won't talk about why Facebook should be broken up because someone has an 80% monopoly, it just doesn't make sense, but, or can influence our thinking, but, um, or perhaps just evil, but uh, <laughs> we'll go there. But, but the basic fundamental idea that we have a chance to bring the world together as one, as human race. We've never in our life had a chance ever before for everyone to be on the same page, literally, at least as much as possible, and God willing, we get the other three billion up. Someone can have an idea in any third world country, as long as they have internet access, they can put out a project, they could actually do a token, they could raise funds. No longer should people be that disadvantaged because they're not in Miami or New York City or London or Tokyo or someplace else. Anyone who has access to the internet, that's the change. And you're gonna to start to see that in capital markets. The very interesting thing to me about the T0 offering, in fact, is that when I worked on Wall Street, we had New York hours, Tokyo hours, London hours. These days, when you guys that trade crypto, you know it's 24 seven all the time. Now, for your own ADHD purposes, you might wanna turn off your you know, your, your, your phone a little bit at dinner time and maybe forget about trading at night in Asia and just actually sleep. Um, but, but we have this magical moment in time where people with ideas can get capital and we get to disrupt the venture community. We get to disrupt everybody. The only thing you need to be able to do is tell your story. If you could share your story, so if I had a conference <laughs> business for argument's sake, um, I'm not on blockchain, my conference is not a blockchain business, but I need, let's say, $10 million. I'm willing to pledge 20% of my EBITDA to the people who hold my tokens. I can go out, do a security token offering, and say, and hope that based on my community that I've been around for 23 years, I could possibly raise this money. Maybe I don't, but it's a possibility that I do, and if I can, I don't give up equity ownership for it. That never was available before. So we're in this new world order. Um, <laughs> the world order is going to change by magnitudes, and you can look at blockchain and ads. There's, I mean, there's, I've been looking at 27 different industries today with their projects for. 
whether you're into ad tech, whether you're into space, whether you're into uh, real estate, whether you're into um, knowledge, whether you're, there, it's unbounded where people are going. This is the early, early, early days. Uh, for those cowboys out there, just be aware that if you can help the sheriffs, sheriffs do their jobs, so if you see bad things happening, you report it or otherwise stay away, that, that we'll have an opportunity for great things to happen because it's an amazing world out there. We can do this, but we have to work together. We have to be able to find common ground, find best practices, and work together because the potential has never been for it's just mind-boggling to me about what can happen in terms of wealth creation on one side, but change on the other. Being able to shift access to capital to countries that never had access to capital can happen. You know, the thing about the dot-com era, by the way, yes, people went broke, but it also created, you know, if you will, dot-com millionaires and billionaires. This era, people will lose their money, <laughs> but we will also have trillionaires. Somebody will wake up one day, look at their wall, and say, oh my fucking God, I'm a trillionaire. <laughs> now, I, I, I don't know what you're gonna do about it. I, I hope that you pre-describe to do good for the world, that you decide to do great things, that you do no harm. It's up to you, but I do think we have that opportunity for fantastic change, but it holds to you and your legacy that you leave behind you. So, I'm very, very grateful to be in front of you guys today. Um, I thank you for listening to me. I, I hope that when you go on your crypto experience, you actually do great things and, and have the opportunity to also be a change agent because when you can change things for the better, it feels so good when you're in front of everyone else. Thank you very much. I'm Jeff Rose. Anyone have any questions before the next? Oh, yes? Uh, you can email Jeff at alchemist.com, we can talk about it. There are lots of organizations that are taking common ground, but not every organization is talking to each other. So I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to connect some of the dots together so that we all talk the same language. Uh, anyone else? Really? Wow. Well, yeah? Where do you see the, where do you see this moving into an industry like food, logistics? Transportation management. So there, there are people that are doing great work in supply chain. There are great people work through. I've actually, I have an Aggie startup, uh, Aggie ICO I'm looking at for people who want to help solve world hunger uh, out of uh, Argentina and Brazil. There, there are people doing projects. They're not all discovered. They're not all in English. But, but it's happening. And th these are people trying to work with governments and government entities to help do world, because we're changing monetary policy. Look, at the end of the day, banking is fucked. I'm sorry, but it just is. <laughs> There's a whole world growing up out there right now where the kids, millennials and, and Gen Z, Gen, they're not, they don't have bank accounts. Yet, they're going to want to do commerce. We have to find ways to enable people that are alienating on their own or culturally to be able to connect with us. So as far as projects go, there's, blockchain is gonna be part of it. I mean, the thing about voice over IP that I always was fascinated by is that we, voice over IP worked great on a land, and then we killed ourselves trying to make it work on the public internet. Blockchain was born on the public internet, and now you're going to see its great success is going to happen behind firewalls, on its own, on its own, on its own between side chains and private. Um, it's just, that's where it's going to be. So, in terms of what's happening, I, there are a lot of industries learning. The bankers, they're just you know, I have no comment public about it. But, but when Jamie, Jamie Dimon comes out one day and says that 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 that, that Bitcoin is basically a Ponzi scheme, and the next day say maybe we'll use it, you know, what does that mean to you? So. It's crazy. Alon, you had a question? Oh, by the way, this guy saved my life. Please give him a round of applause. Please. <laughs> this guy who's about to ask a question or make a statement, he co-founded this company, Vocal Tech. They issued, they created, the iPhone was not born in, 19, in 2007 in, in California. It was born in Israel in 1995. And Woo. it was his product that I became obsessed, obsessed with. This is the reason I got fired, so thank you. No, <laughs> You mentioned cryptocurrencies, but you know the blockchain is part of uh, many other technologies, right? How would you define for simple people what is the blockchain? So it's sort of like asking me, you know, who is the matrix? <laughs> <laughs> In fact, what's really funny is if you look at some of the currencies being traded, some of them like NEO are all directly influenced by the matrix. 
We'll just say that, we could simply say it's like a database. It is a database. It's, it's open, there's a ledger. You know, in accounting, I never thought in my life that be, having a BBA in accounting would matter. Mm -hmm. But, but this open ledger, I get, I'm an, I used to be an accountant, not practiced. And so it's a database, it's information. Some people can put store data in it, but the one thing about most, most blockchains is not real time. You can't fly a plane on the blockchain. It's not gonna happen. And if someone's offering to fly a plane on the blockchain, don't go on that plane, please. <laughs> so it's an opportunity for, to access data with information that won't get deleted. So if you want to be able to have information stored forever, in theory, and you, and you have a whole methodology of centralized and decentralized, and some people only do decentralized. But when you're dealing with security tokens, one of the challenges, because you want to be SEC compliant, is you have, you have basically the idea of an accredited investor. So if you're an accredited investor, and you're AML, KYC people, which is uh, anti-money laundering and know your customer, you have to only transfer the ownership of a security token to another accredited investor. So there's some limitations. So, I see that being more of a centralized exchange. But in terms of blockchain itself, it's a database. You can look at a spreadsheet, flat file, start it all there, right? Or a text file, and it grows. And some people overly complicate this. But what we're really talking about is the freedom to share information and the freedom to communicate this information with others anywhere in the world simultaneously, all the time, forever. Forever long, forever is. Okay, one more time, more. yes? Hi. Hi, hi. It's always a pleasure to meet with you, Jeff. I wanted one is to ask you about education. I think education is going to change. It, that needs to be disrupted. Being even in the education environment, I think, and especially blockchain, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. On blockchain and education, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that there's, we've come a long way in terms of being able to, with, 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 with being able to use, leverage YouTube to teach and certainly Khan Academy and others are actually taking core knowledge and transferring it, but I, there is actually um, a, a project as simple as putting people's report cards on the blockchain to make sure that they're stored, stored forever. But <laughs> the basic, or put a syllabus, but there's actually report cards on the chain. I, I didn't, did not invest in this, but I thought it was a great idea uh, of being able to at least introduce a concept. But what you will see soon, I mean, as basic as learning, knowing spreadsheets and word processing, and, and, and database are today. For a long time in the 80s, I was one of the top 20 experts in the world on spreadsheets. Remember. You remember, remember that? With my, with my, with my, I had spreadsheet with my solutions, mind, and, I, and I, I did that, right? So today, a little bit of knowledge goes a far way. And so I, I do I remember believe, when they stole your functions, too. Yeah, oh, yes, 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 yes. That was a long time ago, yes. Anyway, so I, do, I believe in it. Uh, anyway, yes? What about, I mean, we, we, since this morning, everybody's talking about the, the companies, uh, you know, like the crowds of sourcing. What about the government? Because, you know, that's another place that I always think about the blockchain can bring some speed. Even though the blockchain itself is not that fast as we talk, but, you know, the government is really slow. And a lot of stuff in the government is done, like, uh, requires ownership of certain documents, certain process. I, I can't comment because I might be in contact, but I'll just su suggest that it's not as slow for the government as it is for us. That, that they may have used these technologies to do other things, and perhaps that they're able to uh, scan addresses, <laughs> and maybe for projects they are scanning people's addresses, they may not know who owns those addresses, but they know where things are being transferred all the time. Right. No, but I'm, I'm no, no, so, so they can do I'm it. I'm not talking about, like, you know, they are looking what has been done on the blockchain. I'm no, no, they're like, utilizing the blockchain. Trust me, in five blockchain. years or less, we might be able to fly an airplane on that blockchain. It's happening. I mean, people are, I mean, I, I just, uh, I, I stay away from the hype of it. I, I do think the opportunity is there. One more question, I'm going to end. Yes? First of all, there is a blockchain uh, government association to answer the gentleman's question, and they have a, an office here in downtown Miami in some kind of a venture cafe. You can go there and talk to people about it. And my question to you is, how do you deal with blockchain audit and the uh, the point that Jamie was making, that there is a lack of fraud in it and protect your own investment from frauds. What do you do to verify that you are not investing in fraudsters? So I'm a very conservative, um, uh, yeah, look, I invest in 400 startups. Not you personally, but the Alchemy and the other. No, for Al so as alchemists, we're in the business of helping to, well, we do our own um, uh, validation before we take on clients and we, we do a lot of due diligence before we do any work, and then as as, as a business that we're I'm vice chairman of Alchemist, and certainly we do 
Um, What's an example of a due diligence that you do that this crowd can also use and avoid the investing in all the frauds? <coughs> I would look on the boards, go, go on Telegram, uh, understand that, the, the, and I'll take one more minute. There's a problem here, and that's people lie. Right. <laughs> and, and that is a fundamental <laughs> problem. And so people are going to stand up behind lies, and others will make lies. Even on an ICO, the crazy thing is today, I've seen whales come in on a deal where it was a $20 million raise that came in for eight. They went in publicly, anonymously, and attacked the deal so that no one else would invest, so they would have a percentage much more than the deal. I've never seen as an investor, I've never trashed an investment to discourage other investors from coming in. So that goes on. Separately, if you look at certain projects and their claims, and even if you notice who's an advisor who might just disappear momentarily, you know, it's, it's a very hard thing to figure out truth. This is why we need to have best practices. I was thinking of creating the equivalent of a LinkedIn for, for advisors, for people who want to provide advisory services, to provide some quality of service. This is so early in this game. So we don't have best, we need accounting practices. We, don't, we need generally accepted accounting prints. Uh, we, need, we need gap, we need tax, we need so much in the US and abroad. This is not a US phenomenon, it's not a Canadian phenomenon, it's not an Australian phenomenon, it's worldwide. We need to find consensus worldwide for businesses. We need to figure out custody. Particularly, this is why most of Wall Street will not put money into utility. There's no custody. Custody is slowly being figure, figured out. But when you see AIG or another company like that doing reinsurance, we know that fraud has been taken care of. Because until that happens, there's going to be a, a total yin and a yang between it happening and not. But uh, privately, I can share with you things that are fraud, but I will never, ever, ever, by accident, hurt one of my friends. Because um, you, know, you do things by accident sometimes. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great afternoon.